Discretion is the better part of valor. Some have been thought brave because they didn't have the courage to run away. Valor is of no service. Chance rules all. And the brave are often killed at the hands of cowards. He that fights and runs away will live to fight another day. But he that is in battle slain will never rise to fight again. These are classic sayings about warfare and they aren't ones that extol the virtues of bravery and never surrender. And you know, those sayings um, that are extol warriors to fight on to the bitter end are often acclaimed by the public. It is sometimes those warriors themselves who recognize the value in exiting the battlefield before one can attain a glorious death. You know, and I think the wisdom behind these sayings can help you create a homebrewed world that is more real and interesting for your players. Because, you know, even though it's based in a fantasy environment, D&D, at some level, is based on the only world we know, which is the real world. You know, so the animals and sentient creatures of D&D are going to be based upon those that we see in the real world, whether it's mimicking that behavior or somehow in opposition to it. So I say when you have a dangerous situation, whether it's an actual battle or the opportunity for one, and, you know, one or more of the combatants see that there's an opportunity to turn tail and run, I say, let's head for the hills. Hello again, folks. K.R. King here helping you homebrew your own D&D campaign. And I'm continuing on my move to various locations until I finally settle into my permanent home studio. I've The clock behind me, I'm hoping it's a stopped clock. I'm hoping like it, I can be you know, write at least twice per day. So anyway, this video is about running away or giving up. You know, and I think this can be an overlooked strategy by GMs and players when you're doing encounters in D&D. When we first started, we used to do dungeon crawls. We'd just break into whatever room, and it was always a fight to the death. Hopefully the monster's death. You know, and we were gamers. We understood battle tactics and whatnot. But we never really thought about, well, maybe these creatures would just run away. You know, and in fact, in the real world, fighting to the death is kind of rare. I mean, only cultures where there's a fanatical sense of honor, one must never surrender or give up. Uh, or if one side realizes their opponents don't take prisoners, uh, so they just have to. And in history, most military encounters actually reflect this. They're often one side, the common soldiers just break and run. You know, and instinctive creatures, you know, animals or insects, you know, will run if they're, if they're severely injured or they, you know, see that their opponent is superior to them unless they have a very good reason to stay. So does this mean that in order to have battle verisimilitude, uh, the various NPCs and creatures in your world are going to be constantly looking for the first opportunity to run away? No. And there's a couple reasons for this. You know, the number one rule of playing D&D is to have fun. And if every time the players have an encounter and the things go a little south for the other side, they run off, it's not that fun. The thing is your players have rolled up these characters. They've figured out their spells and specialties, backgrounds, weapons, expertise, and they want to use them against nasty creatures that deserve death. So you don't want to deny your players the experience of winning bad. And the other thing relates to another rule I have in terms of, you know, running a D&D campaign, which is balancing this verisimilitude with the suspension of disbelief. You know, however often people, animals, whatever, in the real world would run away from battles in D&D, Way more creatures and whatnot fight to the death. Why? Because it's a game. And, you know, you could always come up with a host of reasons for why creatures in D&D would fight to the death. You know, if they're intelligent and they have a social structure, there could be a very strong sense of shame or whatever if you, you know, retreat or surrender. You know, for example, I, I always talk about, I think of the orcs more like Vikings than the sort of, you know, chaotic, evil brutes that they're sometimes portrayed as. The Vikings had a very elaborate system in terms of getting to Valhalla, getting to paradise. And it didn't come from running away or from surrendering. The only way to get there was to die in battle. And the other thing is, if you trap any creature with no hope of escape, they will fight with incredible ferocity and often to the death. And this isn't just trapping them in a physical space. If a you know mother bear uh, has an opportunity to escape, but her cubs are going to be killed, she's not going to do that. She's going to fight to the death to protect them. And you have acolytes, you know, at a sacred site that would much sooner die than be known to have retreated from this site. The thing is, just as these rationales help explain why creatures in D&D would 
fight to the end, you can also come up with rationales for why, you know, the NPCs, creatures would retreat from a battle that, you know, makes sense and your players don't feel cheated. Because you're not going to use this tactic, you know, as often say as it might be realistic, but when you do it, it's going to enhance the game playing experience. It's also important to understand the difference between running away and surrendering. Creatures are going to be much more likely, if they can, to run away than surrender. Why? Because when you surrender, you're putting yourself at the mercy of your opponent. So most NPCs and monsters would only surrender if there's, you know, there's no way to escape and the consequences of, you know, running away are worse than those of surrendering. And you also have, you know, even in societies that have martial values and whatnot, you have cowards, right? People that just, I don't want to be here. People that are in battle unwillingly. And then you have captives and slaves who think, hey, being captured would be better than what I've got. All right, so when you're creating an encounter and you're trying to figure out, you know, whether or not, you know, how is there a chance that these creatures are going to flee or surrender? The key is, like with all things uh, in terms of being a GM, is to prepare. In a general sense, you want to have an idea of the creatures, you know, and NPCs or whatnot in your world that would have a tendency to run away or surrender and those that would not. So if we start with just animals, which operate on an instinctive level, as I said before, in the real world, they will flee if the situation is out of hand, unless they are protecting their kin or they just have no option. And the thing about using this tactic is it can actually speed up your game because, you know, let's say a pride of lions attacks your party and the dominant lion is killed. The other lions decide to flee, right? Well, here's the thing. You avoided having to roll out a battle that was kind of a foregone conclusion. You give the players experience. They defeated the pride of lions and they're not wasting spells and the time. Because the thing is, you want to get to the important battles. Well, so you're going to say, well, if you're going to have battles where the, the combatants just flee, why have them at all? Why not just have the important battles that, you know, mean something in the fight to the end? Well, there's a couple reasons. One, you know, let's say the, the players are entering the forest of death and they're going to to the center where this green hag lives to, to get rid of her. She's been, you know, ravaging a local village. Well, it is the forest of death you're going to have encounters. But with verisimilitude, you're, there are going to be some animals or whatnot or things that, you know, may not necessarily want to fight the players, but they're, you know, patrolling around eating. Again, it's the forest of death. You know, and having something run away doesn't mean it's gone for good. Uh, suppose the players, you know, they encounter a giant spider that's you know, the webs through a series of labyrinths. Uh, and they stab the spider a la Shelob in Lord of the Rings and the spider flees. You know, is it gone for good? What if it has an egg sac that it's protecting? See, what happens when the spider runs off is that you have an opportunity for a more interesting encounter. Uh, suppose it just goes to some side tunnel that it has. The players linger, they explore. You know, they find a humanoid still dangling, still alive in one of the webs, and they find the egg sac. Does the spider decide, you know what, I'm going to make a last ditch attack and it goes for the player, you know, examining what it wants to protect. All right, so then we move up. What about really low intelligence monsters? Let's say an Ankeg. I've seen this monster run where it just attacks and attacks until, you know, the party kills it. But is that realistic? I mean, they have a one intelligence, but they operate on instinct. Let's say the group, you know, inflicts two thirds of the Ankeg's hit points in one turn. Is it just going to take it? You know, is it an unthinking eating machine with no sense of its own mortality or is it going to be like, I'm going to disengage and go back into my tunnels? And here again, if you're worried the players are going to be like, every time we almost kill something, it runs away, you know, or whatever. You can do a, a sort of a Gygaxian thing, right? He always came up with roles for things. You could say something like, if a creature like an Ankeg, a one intelligence creature, you know, takes two thirds or more of its hit points on one turn, you roll a die, let's say five or six on a six sided die, and it runs away. Because when it's still a chance thing, you're not punishing the players necessarily for dealing so much damage, but it's realistic that it's reaction of taking so much damage. All right, so then when you get to, you know, sentient creatures, you know, humanoids and whatnot, you have more complex motives for, you know, running away or surrendering. And we used to always think of creatures like, you know, goblins or kobolds as much more likely to run away than, you know, tougher things like hobgoblins or ogres. But in all these cases, you have strong social cons you know, constraints against running away or whatever. And you have religious ones. You know, in the world of D&D, the gods are real. They don't like their followers uh, to be running away or surrendering. Unless there's a really good reason for this. And this is what makes, you know, the, the, the running away option or whatever, you know, more interesting. It's more complex. 
Because it isn't just pure survival that might motivate them to run away or surrender, it can be used as a strategy. You know, the orcs scatter into the trees, knowing that the party members won't be able to catch all of them. You know, one or more will escape, go to the village where the rest of the tribe is, and come back to avenge their loss. Or the orcs have a clever leader who says, hey, if you run into these, these kind of humanoids and you're overwhelmed, just surrender. They know that lawful good characters tend not to just kill things out of hand that have surrendered. If they take them with you, you can slow them down, you can lead them back to us, you know, leave clues or whatnot. Or suppose this group of orcs lives in the forest of death that I used in my earlier example. Are they allies with the green hag? Will some run off to, you know, tell her that there's intruders in your forest? You know, are they rivals of the green hag such that they will flee or run off knowing that the group may be heading into the center of the forest to get rid of their number one enemy? And here again, the motivations for creatures to run away or surrender can be more complex and interesting than simply to fighting to the death. And then you get to very intelligent creatures where I think the motivation to run away especially is very strong. Suppose the players run into a Mind Flayer and they're winning the battle. The Mind Flayer does not want to be killed at the hands of these lowly humanoids, so he's going to use his Plane Shift ability to get away. But the thing is, is he going to forget this humiliation? Oh no, no. Because this is very important. No one likes to lose and the, you know, intelligent creatures in D&D really hate to lose. And this is another aspect of why, you know, running away can be such an interesting tactic because it creates grudges and rivalries of those that have, you know, survived but lost a battle with the group. So you give the players full experience. They defeated the Mind Flayer. Uh, you know, it shifted away, but now it's it knows this group. It may be out to just, you know, attack and destroy them or to thwart their plans. So as I said, surrender is a final option. You know, again, you're at the mercy of, of your opponent, but you can be used as a strategy like I explained. Uh, you can also have the classic, you know, shifty coward who surrenders uh, just to see what he can get uh, from this new group. Maybe he betrays his former comrades. Or maybe he gets information and then he you know, leaves in the middle of the night to warn his former comrades. You can also have, as I said, a person who's enslaved, held against their will, this sort of thing, prisoners who are only too glad to surrender. All right, so these are the various rationales. Now, then what you want to think about when you're creating an encounter is whether or not you think these creatures might surrender, depending on how the battle goes, and how realistic is it for them to be able to escape. You know, slow creatures, you know, that are slower than the group are going to have a hard time disengaging and getting away. Unless they can fly, you know, maybe straight up in the air or they can go, you know, into an area the players can't follow. I mentioned the planar shift, but it can be low intelligence, you know, an ooze that can go through a one inch crack in the rocks. Again, an ooze only has a one intelligence, but it wants to live. But, you know, then even if the creatures have the speed and desire to try to get away, uh, is it realistic in terms of where they are? So if you're in a dungeon and you've got creatures in a room with only one exit and the players are there, they can't get away. But if they can get away, do they know the dungeon well enough to just dash for multiple turns and not get lost, not, you know, go to a dead end, or not run into something nastier than the player characters? So again, would, you know, creatures linger in a room with only one exit? Yeah. I wouldn't. So, you know, if you have Goblin Lair, there's going to be all sorts of exits, all sorts of small passages. You know, if the players encounter Goblin Guards, they're going to try to run into one of these if they're not killed in that first turn to warn the other Goblins. And the thing is, if creatures live in a place, they're going to be very familiar with it. They're going to know where the, you know, exits and side tunnels are, and they're going to hang out there. So in the wilderness terrain matters. If you're in a swamp, a creature adapted to that terrain, say a Bullywood, is going to have a much better chance of being able to just flee into the swamp and get away uh, than, say, some bandits that are just temporarily hiding out there. But, of course, if the bandits choose to just scatter and run, uh, they're going to have an easier time, you know, in a swamp or a heavy forest than, say, in a desert or tundra. You know, and in mountain terrain, something like a yeti could more easily uh, disengage than other creatures who just say, look, if I try to run off, I have a chance of falling to my death, so I might as well just, you know, either surrender or just fight to the bitter end. So you think about, you know, what percentage of encounters where you want to have the possibility that creatures could run away or even more rarely surrender. You come up with good rationales for that in terms of their abilities and their backstories and whatnot. 
uh, and you use this. And the thing is, what it really does, as I said, with the animal encounters, it speeds up the game. You know, and unless you and your players love to fight every single battle all the way to the end, and some people do, you know, you're going to have more fun when you have encounters where clearly they're just going to run away, we're going to move on, and you're giving them experience, they have the victory, but it's realistic. And you move on to the fun step. So if you like what you've seen, please subscribe to my channel. I'm always looking for more. Leave some comments. I love to read them and answer them. Most importantly, my friends, keep playing this game we love, D&D, and tell somebody else about it.